with all the online content you could be watching. We're glad you're joining us as we find and follow Jesus together. All right, tell me this. Have you ever gone to a restaurant and you order your food and they bring it out and you're like, that's different than what I thought that I was getting. When we were first married, we've been married for just a few months. Nicole and I went out to dinner. Her folks took us out and they wanted to take us to a nice restaurant. They took us to this fancy place. In fact, it was so fancy that I didn't recognize almost anything on the menu. I'm like looking through it and I'm like, where's the corn dogs and mac and cheese? You know, like, I don't know what this stuff is, but I'm scanning through and I finally see a word I know. The word scallops. I go, okay, scallops. I know what that is. I'll order the scallops. So that's what I ordered. Our food comes out a little while later and it turns out I actually didn't know what scallops were. I had in my head, I was imagining the word scampi, and so I was expecting a nice plate of shrimp. But what they brought out to me, if you've never had scallops before, imagine marshmallows from the ocean, okay? They're just like (laughs) chewy sea nuggets, like a whole plate of them. They bring this out, and I remember thinking, oh, no, 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 What, what is this? Like, I don't know what this is. When Jesus shows up on planet Earth, that's kind of how God's people feel. They're like, what is this? We, we don't know what we're looking at. They had waited for centuries for the Messiah, for the Savior to come who was going to rescue them. And he's here, and they don't recognize him. This isn't what they ordered. They wanted a king. They wanted a general. Instead, they got a baby. They wanted someone who was educated and good-looking and refined. Instead, they got the son of an unwed teenage girl from Nazareth. He wasn't what they wanted. He wasn't what they were looking for. As we continue today to look at the life of this unexpected Jesus, we're going to learn that not only is Jesus not who they expected, but the things that he's going to say are very different than what they expected him to say. And they're going to look at him like, really? What is happening right here? Because they not only wanted a king, they expected a priest. They expected someone who would fit sort of their idea of religion, religious leader, whatever that was, and he was far from that. So if you got a Bible with you today, we're in Matthew chapter 5. I'd love for you to get that out, turn it on, get out your phone, follow along Matthew chapter 5, and we're going to look at something called the Sermon on the Mount. This is Jesus's first real public teaching, his first sermon. This is his debut, and he's going to say things as he's preaching. He's going to say things that people don't expect, because again, they're expecting a priest, which for them meant religion. It meant laws. It meant rules. Today, I want to show you that what Jesus offers is something far different than religion. Religion is a checklist of things to do. It's just rules and laws to follow. What Jesus offers is different. It's better, but it's unexpected and it's disorienting to people. So I want to get right into it. Let me tell you sort of where we're headed and what this passage holds for us today. The the passage that we're going to look at, it's, it's, to be honest, it's going to be a heart check for us. It's going to kind of ask each of us to be reflective, to look at ourselves and ask, is your heart, is my heart soft Or has my heart grown hard? This passage is a little bit of a a checkup on how's your heart. And you know what I mean. Is your heart soft? Soft to the things that God wants to do? Soft to people? Or has your heart grown hard? And the way that you answer this question is going to have a major impact on how you respond to Jesus' teaching today. So Matthew 5, we'll get into it. Here's the scene. Jesus has started recruiting disciples. People are starting to follow him. There's a buzz about this guy. Rumor has it he can turn water into wine. And everybody's like, that's a cool party trick. And they're hearing that he helped a paralyzed man walk again. People got real fired up when they heard he cast a demon 
out of somebody. So there's all this energy, there's this buzz, this interest about him. Everywhere he goes, crowds are starting to gather. Matthew chapter 5 takes us to the shoreline on the Sea of Galilee. Here's the story, Matthew 5 verse 1. It says, when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and he sat down. His disciples came to him and he began to teach them. So he's got his 12 disciples. They've gathered around. He's going to talk to them. He's going to teach them. But there's also a crowd, likely hundreds of people who have sort of gathered around. He's going to talk to his disciples, but, but they're all listening as well. Here's how he starts in verse 3. He says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now, when he said this, my guess is that everyone is like, he's talking to me. It's one of those sermons. This guy is speaking. This one's for me. He's talking to me right now because he said, blessed are the poor in spirit, the broken, the people that are tired, the people that are at the end of their row. Well, who's that? Everyone, right? Everyone can relate to this. Everyone, every one of us, everyone there today and us, we know what it means to be tired. We know what it means to be at the end of our rope. We know what it means to be broken in spirit. And so I think that's what he's doing. And this is genius because he's talking to the disciples, but everyone there that day on this hillside is like, oh, he's talking to me right now. And it's sort of like he's inviting everyone into the conversation. He's going to talk to his friends that are right in front of him, but he's inviting everyone in as, as if he's saying, have you ever felt hopeless? Have you ever felt tired? Come and listen. Come and listen to what I have to say. And he leads with this. He says, blessed are the poor in spirit. We don't have this word right here. We don't have a great English word for this. It's not a good translation to say it this way, but the word is really happy. Should be happy are the poor in spirit. But we use happy as sort of this kind of trite, fleeting emotion. It means more than that. It's sort of a deep kind of soulful uh, joy, kind of a lasting, divine, uh, given satisfaction. He says, blessed are the poor in spirit. What's he saying? The beginning of his very first sermon. If you're at the end of your rope, if you're tired, if you're broken, if you're feeling helpless, there's hope. Come and listen. And you imagine everybody's just on the edge of their seat going, that's me. I, I want a part of that. He mentions this. He mentions the kingdom of heaven. We're going to talk a bunch more about that. Look what he says. Verse four, blessed are those who mourn. He's got everyone's attention. Blessed are those who mourn for they will be comforted. Again, hope for the hopeless. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. He continues, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Blessed are the merciful. Blessed are the pure in heart. Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness. And he just keeps going, keeps going. And he's drawing people in. And just when you think he's going to say, blessed are the religious. Blessed are the devout. Blessed are the super holy. He doesn't say that. He just stops. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the tired. Blessed are the merciful. Blessed are the broken. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. What is Jesus doing? Okay. He's inviting people in to this conversation. He's telling us that there is something called the kingdom of heaven, and it is a place of blessing. It is a place of happiness, a place of lasting joy and peace. And I think what he's doing, by the way he's framed it, I think what he's doing is he's inviting everyone in and he's saying, this kingdom is for anyone. It's for everyone. It's not just for sort of the spiritually elite, because that's what religion is, right? Religion is for the good guys. Religion is for the rule followers. Religion is for the super holy people. Religion is for the people that hang out in the temple. And incredibly, Jesus' first message is for the poor in spirit. It's for those who are mourning. It's for the broken. It's for the tired. It's for the merciful. It's for the peacemakers. And he says, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And I think what he's doing is inviting everybody in to this conversation. He's saying there's a kingdom available for those who are mourning, for those who are hurting. And he just sort of slides it across to people and goes, is that something you'd even be interested in? He invites them into the conversation. There is a kingdom available. It is hope for the hopeless, help for the helpless, peace, mercy, joy. Is that something that you'd want? Is that something that you're interested in? And, 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 he, and he brings people 
into the conversation this way. We'll keep going because we're going to learn more about the kingdom of heaven. He's going to describe it. I'm going to jump around just sort of a little bit and give you a taste of what he talks about. And just keep in your mind as we're going that the Sermon on the Mount is, it's just that. It's one sermon. It's all one talk. So often we kind of break it up and we nuance it and we, we dive in deep, which is fine. But this is all one conversation. Listen to Jesus, verse 17. He says, do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets, the law and the prophets. The law is the Old Testament, right? It's the Ten Commandments and the other laws that God has given. He's like, I didn't come to get rid of those. I've not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Oh, this is really important. I've not come to get rid of the Old Testament. I've come because I'm the fulfillment of the Old Testament, of the law, of everything that the prophets said. I'm the fulfillment. What is Jesus telling us? He's saying, I'm the Messiah, the one you've been waiting for, the anointed one, the Savior. Hello, that's me. I'm him. And he's saying that my words are equal to, are on the same level as God's words, as the scriptures, the Old Testament, right? I've not come to abolish the law and the prophets. I've come to fulfill it. Verse 18, he says, for truly, I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Therefore, anyone who sets aside one of the least of these commands and teaches, uh, teaches others accordingly will be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. And you can hear the religious leaders standing nearby kind of let out a sigh of relief, like, okay, all right. He's not messing with our laws. He's not messing with our rules. Our religion is still intact, right? They're kind of... Whew, Okay, everything's going to be okay. This guy, I mean, he's interesting. He does cool stuff. But if he screws with our religion, like we're going to have a problem. We're going to have to do something to this guy. And so they kind of relax a little bit because he's like, I'm not here to abolish the law. The religious leaders are happy until he says this, verse 20. He says, for I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. And my friends, this is the day, this is the moment that religion died. Because what Jesus has just said is, you can live by religion. You can live by rules. But you'll never make it. Because you have to be perfect. In fact, he says, you have to be more perfect, not just as perfect as the Pharisees, as the religious leaders. You have to be more perfect than them. And he says this. This is kind of a joke. He's kind of saying this tongue in cheek. You have to be more perfect than the Pharisees because the people that are hearing that are like, that's not possible. The Pharisees are rule followers. They have like 600 laws and they just follow them. They just, every time uh, they, they, they break one, they make another one, right? And they just have all these kinds of rules. They're constantly adding more. And people are thinking, if that's the way into the kingdom of heaven, I have no shot. And I think, I think that's the point of this whole text. I think that's Jesus' setup. His offer is this, to the poor in spirit, to the brokenhearted, to the tired, here's, here's the offer. You can try, he says, you can try religion. You can try and be right with God by doing all the right things, by following a bunch of laws. You can do all your catechisms, all your ceremonies, all your rituals that you want. But you'll never make it, right? It's just not possible. But he goes, here's an offer. Here's the kingdom of heaven. Here's an invitation. Let me show you a new way. It's, oh, it's not what you expected. It's not what you thought. But let me just show you, because this kingdom on the other side, there's happiness and there's joy and there's peace. You can come back and follow religion, but let me show you another way. And for the next two chapters, he describes the kingdom of heaven that he's offering. You can choose religion, he says. It's your choice. But know that you'll never do enough. Or you can have something else. And he goes, let me, let me tell you about it. That God would give people access to him in a relationship and give people access to the kingdom of heaven, not by religion, not by a list of rules, not by their own doing, not by their own holiness and righteousness. No one saw this coming. This is totally unexpected. And for the next two chapters, he's going to describe life in the kingdom of heaven. And just my opinion, 
Sometimes you'll hear people say of the Sermon on the Mount that the Sermon on the Mount is a description or it's instruction for how to live the Christian life. I don't think that's accurate. I don't think this is about just instruction. I think this is invitation. He's inviting us into the kingdom of heaven. He's not giving more rules. He's not giving us a bunch of don't do this, don't do this, do this, do this, do this, do this. Do this. this is going to be an invitation. Jesus is offering an invitation. Are you tired? Are you tired of religion? Do you feel broken by the world? Are you coming up short of laws and rules that you have to follow because you keep failing, let me show you something else. Let me invite you into a different kind of kingdom. This is his father's kingdom. Who's the king of the kingdom of heaven? It's God, right? It's Jesus. He's inviting us in, and he's describing, here's what life is like in the kingdom of heaven. It's not that different than, for example, when, when I brought my wife home, my then girlfriend, now wife, when I brought her home to meet my family, we're driving to our house. What did I do? I prepared her for what to expect, right? This is what life is like in my family. If you want to be a part of this, let me tell you what life is like. And I described some of it for her. In my family, we're going to sit around the dinner table and we're going to eat together and we're going to talk and we're going to laugh. That's something that you should expect. That is life in my family. You got to know my dad is going to tell some corny dad jokes. Like it's just part of the deal. You got to know I have two sisters. They're not going to like you the first time they meet you. You should just know that up front. This is what Jesus is doing. Let me tell you about life in the kingdom of heaven. It's not instruction. It's not do this, do this, do this, do this, do this. It's like this is life in my father's kingdom. Let me describe it for you. And then you can decide. If you want to go back to religion, that's fine. I'll let you do that. Good luck. You can do that. But I think you might want to listen to what life is like. In this kingdom, I think it might be better. So let me just run through some of what he says. And again, don't hear this as instruction. I want you to hear this as invitation. This is life in the kingdom of heaven. Verse 21, Jesus says, so you've heard that it was said to the people long ago, you shall not murder. And anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. He's quoting the Old Testament, right? This is the Ten Commandments. But I tell you, he says, that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister, will be subject to judgment. I think what he's doing is he's telling us that in the kingdom of heaven, people aren't angry. People don't seek revenge. People aren't full of bitterness. Look, he says again, anyone who says to a brother or sister, Raka, that's, that's you know, name calling, is answerable to the court. And anyone who says you fool will be in, the da in danger of the fire of hell. He's saying in the kingdom of heaven, we don't tear each other down. We don't gossip. Again, he's not saying don't be angry. Don't gossip. That's more rules. He's saying I'm inviting you into something new. In the kingdom of heaven, this is what life is like. We don't snap at each other. We're not angry. We don't harbor resentment towards one another. Verse 23, he says, therefore, if you're offering your gift at the altar and remember that you, that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar and go and be reconciled to them. Then come and offer your gift. He's saying that in the kingdom of heaven, people are more important than religion. We build peace in the kingdom of heaven. We reconcile relationships. We, we, we're unified. We don't cause division. He's describing life in his father's kingdom. And it's interesting because in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus uses the word father. He, he talks about his father 15 times. That's not an accident. Who's he talking to? Yes, there's hundreds of people around, but these 12 people that are in front of them, who are they? They're predominantly young men who have just left their own mother and father to follow Jesus. And so he's saying, let me tell you about my father. Let me tell you about his heart. He's connecting us to the heart of God the Father. Let me tell you about his love. Let me tell you about his kingdom. I want you to experience it. See how it's an invitation? I want you to know my father. I want you to know life in his kingdom. Let me tell you about it. He keeps going. He says this about adultery in verse 27. You've heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. Again, Ten Commandments stuff. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. In the kingdom of heaven, he says, we don't lust after our brother and sister. 
because we see them as infinitely valuable, made in the image of God, not just objects of our, of our flesh and lust. He says in verse 31, it's been said, anyone who divorces his wife must give her a certificate of divorce. That's another Old Testament thing. But I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife except for sexual immorality makes her the victim of adultery. He's saying in the kingdom of heaven, we don't just cast people aside. We don't abandon one another. We don't get bored with each other and just sort of move on. He'll go on to say in the kingdom of heaven, we don't swear oaths in God's name. We simply let our yes be yes and our no be no. He's saying in God's kingdom, in the kingdom of heaven, we speak words that are trustworthy and true. Look at verse 38. You've heard that it was said, eye for eye and tooth for tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If someone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek also. If anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, hand over your coat as well. The kingdom of heaven is not one of revenge. It's not one of resentment. The kingdom of heaven is generosity. And it's compassion. It's forgiveness. It's sacrifice. He'll go on and he'll say, in the kingdom of heaven, you love your enemies. Don't be angry. Don't hate anyone. Don't allow your heart to be full of bitterness. He'll say, be generous, not stingy. He'll talk about the spiritual life and say, you have a relationship with God. Talk to him. He says, fast and pray. Take your spiritual life seriously. He'll say, in the kingdom of heaven, we don't focus on material possessions because material is all going to burn up anyway. He says, in the kingdom of heaven, we don't worry because God is in authority and owns our days. He says, in the kingdom of heaven, we don't judge one another. And I, you got to see, this is not instruction. This is not Jesus going, here's a new list of rules, but it is invitation. It's a man who's talking to his friends and going, can I tell you about my father? Can I tell you about his kingdom? He, he's not even like preaching at him. He's not yelling at him. He's just talking with them. Let me tell you about this kingdom that my God, my father has to offer you. Jesus is engaging Right? I imagine Jesus is funny. As Jesus is talking and he, and he says this thing about how you have to be more perfect than the Pharisees. People are laughing. That's funny to them because it's so impossible. I imagine that Jesus, I mean, consider the scene. They're there at the Sea of Galilee. I, I imagine when he says that whole thing about the speck of, of dust in your brother's eye and the, the plank in your own eye, I imagine he picks up a, drift, a piece of driftwood and he's walking around holding this big beam against his eye, making people laugh. He's funny when he talks. He's engaging. When he says that thing about if your right hand causes you to sin, chop it off. I imagine the crowd gasps and then they laugh nervously like this guy's hilarious. He's unbelievable. You got to see this. Yes, he's he is God. He's a man talking to his friends and he's saying you have been lied to. You've been told that it's all about religion. But there's something else. There's a relationship with my father. That's what I want for you. That's what I want to talk to you about. He's inviting them in. He'll go on to say, if you need something, my dad's a good dad. Just talk to him. He's a good father. He wants to provide for you. He'll start to pull it all together in the middle of chapter 7 in verse 13. Jesus says, enter through the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. Here's the invitation. Anyone can be religious. Anyone can have a list of rules. You put them up on the wall, and you try and do your best to follow them. But over and over again, Jesus isn't talking about religion. He's talking about heart, heart, Heart. He's talking about things like compassion, forgiveness, generosity, sacrifice, kindness. It's a relationship driven by the heart of who God is, by the heart of the Father. And it's like he sort of pushes it to the disciples. He extends the offer. What do you want? You want religion? Or do you want a relationship? You pick. You can have religion or relationship. Now, in all fairness, religion is easier. 
A lot of people pick religion because it's easier. It's just a list of rules. You know exactly what to do. Follow it. Relationships, you know, are hard work. Think about the relationships you have. They're they're difficult. But that's what he's inviting us into, a relationship. And what's the difference between religion and a relationship? It's hard, right? It's hard. Think about the relationships that you have. What makes them strong? Is it because you both follow a list of rules? Not at all. It's because of a heart connection, right? It's because you're connected at this sort of heart level. That's what Jesus is inviting us into. No doubt it's going to be hard. Relationships are hard. Think about what Jesus is asking. He's asking us to give up our ability to hold a grudge. He's asking us to give up, give up our, our desire to lust. He's asking us to give up our want to, to harbor bitterness and, 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 and get even with somebody. It's going to be hard work. That's why a lot of people choose religion. Because it sounds so much easier. Just give me a list of rules. I'll follow those and tell me what to do if I break them. That's religion. But Jesus goes, here's, here's a relationship. You can choose religion. You can choose this list of rules or you can have what your soul really longs for, a relationship. Now, what a lot of people have done with the Sermon on the Mount is they've taken this and they've gone way the other direction and they've gone, see, there's no rules. There is no expectations of God. Just love everybody. Just accept them in all ways. And they sort of paint this picture like Jesus is just kind of this like pot smoking hippie and he's sitting on the, you know, the, the hillside. And he's talking with his friends like, man, let's just talk about life. You know, no, that's not it either. That's not a healthy relationship. But do you see the invitation? Do you see the heart level connection that Jesus is going to his friends and he's going, man, Here's what you can have. Do you want it? Is this something that you'd be interested in? And everyone there that day is listening. They're on pins and needles. Tell us more. We want to hear more about the kingdom of heaven. That's what we long for. Religion's not cutting it. Give us that. So I want to spend a few minutes talking about just sort of this heart issue. And I'm going to ask you, today about your heart. I'm going to ask you to reflect a little bit and go, how, how, is, your, how is your heart? See, if I just step back and, and I'm looking at the heart of what Jesus is doing, I've just stepped back at this whole thing, this big picture, and I'm trying to understand what he's talking about. I'm hearing heart. I'm hearing compassion and forgiveness. He's sort of prepping us. He's sort of giving us a, a, a window of life in the kingdom of heaven. But at its core, I think what Jesus is saying is this. Life in the kingdom of heaven and our hearts in the kingdom of heaven is that kingdom hearts are, are soft hearts, right? He's describing life in the kingdom. He's going, life in the kingdom is, is soft-hearted. And I've been asking myself this question a lot lately, and I'll sort of push it to you. Like, how's your heart? Right, like, if kingdom, if, if kingdom hearts are soft, how's your heart? Is it soft? Or is it hard? The parts of it that have grown hard? You know what I mean. Is it soft? You go, how do, how do I know? I, I can tell you a little bit how you know. If you hear all this and you hear Jesus talking and you go, wow, this is not fair. I don't want this. Jesus wants me to give up my ability to get revenge? Mm, I don't know. Some bad stuff's been done to me. Or you read it and you go, Jesus wants to talk about my money? Really, my money? You want to tell me to be generous with my money? It's mine. If you, if you hear and you think those things, to be honest, your heart is probably hard. Today, you need to ask God to soften your heart. Or if you hear all this and you go, okay, cool. New list of rules, right? Don't be angry. Don't lust. Pray more. Fast more. I've got my marching orders. New instructions. And you turn it into a religion. No, that's probably a sign that your heart is hard also. And again, asking God today to soften your heart. Religion is so good at telling us you need to do better. You just, you need to do better. You're failing. You need to do better. And we make more rules. And you know what happens? Our heart gets harder because we fall short again and again. And shame just piles on over and over. But what God wants from us and for us is a soft heart. So how would a soft heart respond to what Jesus is saying here in the Sermon on the Mount? Just two things I want to show you. Just kind of two heart checks for you. One is this. Is that a soft heart, a soft heart surrenders. In any relationship, there is some level of 
surrender. That's how you know it's a, a relationship is that we, we give something towards it, right? When you get married, you give up some of the freedom that you had as a single person. When you have kids, you give up autonomy that you had when you didn't have kids. But the thing is that you want to. That's the difference between religion and a relationship. In a relationship, you want to surrender. You want to give up some freedom. Jesus isn't asking us to adhere to more rules. He's asking us to surrender in relationship. In the kingdom of heaven, I give up my right to vengeance because vengeance belongs to the Lord. And I trust him that he will administer justice. In the kingdom of heaven, I give up my right to anxiety because the days belong to God and he owns my life. And so as he maps it out, I follow. But again, relationship. And so what Jesus promises to give, his part of the deal is blessing, peace, happiness, joy, comfort, inheriting everything that is his, seeing God. And so I know for me, as, as I think about this idea of, of surrender, it's, I'm quick to go, you know, I surrendered my heart to God a long time ago. Yes, true. But there's ways that I let my heart grow hard. There's ways that I've surrendered my heart to God and I sort of pull some of it back sometimes, right? Okay, God, I'll be compassionate to lots of people, but that person, you know what they did to me? God, let me tell you what they said about me. God, I have the email right here. Let me show you what they said to me. You'll understand, right? And I, I let part of my heart get hard. Is your heart fully surrendered? When Jesus goes through the Sermon on the Mount and he describes life in the kingdom of heaven, is your heart completely surrendered to God? Maybe you need to ask him to help you soften your heart today. The second theme of a soft heart is this, is that a soft heart obeys. And you hear that word and you go, there it is. I knew religion was coming because obedience, we think, is about religion. But no, not in this context. Listen to how he ends the sermon because obedience flows from love. He says, not everyone who says to me, in verse 21, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father, who is obedient to the will of my Father, right? Who is in heaven, he says, in fact, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and drive out demons and perform miracles in your name? Listen, but I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. We didn't have a relationship. You followed religion. I wanted a relationship with you. And we didn't have that. He says, away from me, evildoers. A soft heart obeys out of love, not out of religion or obligation, but out of love for Jesus and the things that he's taught. Let me see if I can bring this together and we'd be super practical. Some of you, your heart is hard right now. And I know you think you're managing it. Maybe you can for a while, but it starts to come out and it comes out sideways, right? It becomes anger on the people around you. It becomes, you disengage from your family. And it all connects back to a relationship. You're not living in a healthy kingdom relationship with Jesus. Oh, I'm not saying your sins aren't forgiven. I'm not saying you haven't surrendered your, your hearts and for your salvation. I'm saying that right now in a day-to-day -day sense, you're not living in a healthy relationship with Jesus. That surrender and obedience are words far from your mind. You know what it feels like for your heart to be hard. Maybe today you need to ask God to soften your heart. Maybe your family needs you to ask God to soften your heart because you're a jerk. You're angry. You're bitter all the time. There is a relationship with your heavenly father that is so much better. He wants to connect with you at a heart level. Would you ask him today to soften your heart? Others of you, your heart is hard today because you're blatantly disobeying God. You are blatantly shutting him out. You know what he said. And yet your heart is full of pride and lust and greed and bitterness. Again, you're not living in a healthy kingdom relationship with Jesus. And the Holy Spirit is speaking to you. He's telling you that your heart is hard. And if you would just ask, he would soften it.
But you have to ask. He's not going to force his way into your life. Today, do you need to ask God to soften your heart? God, my heart is hard. God, I've been full of anger, bitterness, and jealousy. God, I'm so full of anxiety and worry. Would you soften my heart, God? Jesus is not what people expected. He didn't offer religion. He offered a relationship. It's your choice. You could take religion. A lot of people do, and you understand why, because it's easier. Relationships are hard work. But this relationship is one of peace and joy and happiness. It's what your soul longs for. So I don't know about you, but I want to ask God to soften my heart, to draw me into obedience and surrender and deeper into this relationship today and every day. Let me pray. With your head bowed and your eyes closed, if you need to ask God to soften your heart today, do it. If you need to ask God to take away the anger that's in your heart, do it now. If you need to confess to God and ask him to soften your heart because you're full of lust and pride, do it now. Our Father and our God, we've fallen for religion We've settled for a list of rules to follow. And when you speak, when Jesus says that what he offers is a relationship, it's like water to our soul. And you promise a heart connection with our Father, our perfect Heavenly Father. It's exactly what we need. God, today, would you soften our hearts so that we could hear from you, that we could walk with you? God, would you break us of the chains of religion, draw us into a relationship? Would you help us to surrender if there are areas in our life that we're holding tightly to? God, would you help us to be obedient, not out of obligation, but out of love, to be obedient to the things that Jesus spoke. God, thanks for Jesus. Thanks that he comes in this unexpected way. But as always, your ways are better. Though unexpected, they far exceed what we could imagine. And so we thank you. Thank you that we have access to you, God, in a relationship through your son, Jesus Christ. We pray these things in his powerful name. Amen.